The Old Testament lesson this morning comes from the book of 2 Samuel. I will be reading verse 1 and then 17 to 27. Let us listen for God's word. After the death of Saul, when David had returned from defeating the Amalekites, David remained two days in Ziklag. David intoned this lamentation over Saul and his son Jonathan. He ordered that the song of the bow be taught to the people of Judah. It is written in the book of Jashar. He said, Your glory, O Israel, lies slain upon your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath. Proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon. Or the daughters of the Philistines will rejoice. The daughters of the uncircumcised will exult. You mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew or rain upon you, nor bounteous fields. For there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul anointed with oil no more. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back, nor the sword of Saul return empty. Saul and Jonathan, beloved and lovely, in life and in death, they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. O daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you with crimson and luxury, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan lies slain upon your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Greatly beloved were you to me. Your love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen, and the weapons of war perished. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One summer evening, much like what we've been experiencing here, there was a violent thunderstorm, and a mother was tucking her little boy into bed, and she was about to turn off the lights when his Little lips were trembling, and he asked his mother if she would sleep with him that night. And his mother smiled, and she gave him this reassuring hug, and she said, Sweetie, I can't sleep with you. I have to sleep with Daddy. And there was this long silence that was finally broken by the little child going, Daddy's just a big baby. <laughs> Like some of you in this congregation, I grew up in the scouting organization, and I remember with great fondness the camping trips, especially the two weeks of summer camp at Girl Scout Camp. And those were days that were filled with fun and laughter, horseback riding, crafts, canoeing, and swimming. The evenings, they were spent around the campfire. We'd sing songs and roast marshmallows, make s'mores even tell a few little ghost stories. And then it was time for the trek back to our platform tents. They had canvas sides that were all rolled up, lest it rain, then we could put them down. But we would walk back and we'd have our little flashlights, only the giddiness that little girls can do in the dark. But finally came time for lights out. You'd lie on your bunk. You'd stare into that inky darkness, and the nighttime sounds of the critters outside of the tent, it began with this little low hum. And as the minutes ticked by, they got loud and louder and louder, and your imagination started playing, and the animals were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And before you knew it, you had Jurassic Park just outside of your tent. <laughs> As the adult class discussed this morning, there are times when life becomes filled with frightening circumstances. Times when the tranquility of the moment is intruded upon by uncertainty, by things with which we are unfamiliar, we don't understand, the unexpected. Those moments when darkness appears to be looming all around and with each passing day the circumstances just seem to enlarge. 
And I think this is some of what David was feeling in the passage that I just read as he deals with the death of his greatest enemy, Saul, and his dearest friend, Jonathan, a friend who was more faithful to him than perhaps even a spouse to their partner. This poem marks a deep, precious, and hurtful moment in the life of Israel. It would be a moment of powerful transition for Israel, as well as David. A time for people and a nation to remember, to feel their grief, to ponder their future, and to acknowledge the grief and loss that surrounded the soul of a nation. Sometimes in the confusion of life, the frightening times, uncertain treatment for illness, the loss of a relationship, circumstances at work, in the midst of challenges or demands, we let our souls get lost within us. Sometimes we lose touch with what is at the center of our being, the very soul of life itself, running in dizzying circles around life's outer edges. The passage that I read to you is a reminder of a twofold rhythm of life that we need to keep in front of us. A twofold rhythm of renewal and action and of retreating and involvement. Renewal and action and retreating and involvement. In David's grief for Saul and Jonathan, we are keenly aware that David doesn't know what will happen next. Nevertheless, for the length of this passage, all the dangerous ambiguity of David's future is put on hold. It's put on hold. There's a moratorium on power so that there can be a full honoring of grief. So there can be the recognition that Life has changed now. A time for the consideration of the feeling of others. In this action, we see that David has a remarkable capacity to sort out what is crucial from what is marginal. We see a remarkable capacity to dispense with self-interest so the focus can be on what is best for the entire community. I think, too, that David's behavior shows us something about public grieving. Public grieving. At times, our society doesn't do that very well. We're prone to want to get back to business as quickly as we can, or we have a tendency that, that we just we want to play like a little ostrich. We'll just be a little ostrich and put our head in the sand and We'll just pretend that none of that ever happened. Everything's just fine. Perhaps this point from David will help us to understand the importance of stepping back and fully experiencing our feelings and even our grief. Seizing the opportunity to retreat for a moment Allowing ourselves time for renewal and reflection. <coughs> Doing these things can lead to informed decision making. This coming Wednesday, our nation will be celebrating its independence from the rule of another country. Our celebration of certain inalienable rights, those things professed by all people, Rights that even allow us to be in this place worshiping without fear of governmental persecution or death. David's song from 2 Samuel is a song of relentless, candid faith. Words that could guide us in finding the words to frame answers, to find direction so we can become more fully involved and be willing to risk taking action. Sound religion is often a matter of finding the right words, 
Words that will let us genuinely experience, process, and embrace the edges of life. It is vital that the church learns to say what it means and to mean what it says in both word and action and that this be at the center of the church's life. And I hope this is something the session clings to as they begin setting a definite vision for our future in this community. There is in our society a dominant ideology that would prefer to silence serious speech, to cover over all serious loss, to refuse to risk conflict that could bring about change. And this silencing is accomplished through the reduction of life through a technique that promises to meet the wants and wishes and desires of the greatest number of people in power or whoever is the squeakiest wheel. David has the right words and offers to us the recognition that the Bible is a book for our strange, honest speaking about the limits of life, about the sadness in life, about the diversity of God's creation, and about God's inclusive promises. Amid the national politics of incitement, we as Christians offer the message of grace and love and peace and mercy and justice and inclusion. Each and every one of us has the potential for renewal in our lives, to be revived in our hearts and our minds and our souls, but it will happen only when we open our minds and our hearts to embrace with equality and fairness. And that's what we hear from the Apostle Paul if we look over in the book of Corinthians. I'm going to share this with you because I think it's really important given where we are in our country right now. Paul says, I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of a fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need, in order that there may be a fair balance. Now that word in this scripture, balance, in the original Greek, isostas, is used only one other time in the entire New Testament. It is a word that means equality and fairness, true balance. And in this passage, Paul is making an appeal to the basic Christian sense of fellowship, a koinonian community. And as a Christian community, we are knitted together by virtue of faith and out of this common conviction arises a mutual concern for one another to respond to the cries in our midst, the cries that are out there. The ones of you who are history buffs are familiar with the Venetian traveler Marco Polo. And he wrote a book that was entitled The Travels of Marco Polo. Not hard title. And he inspired other adventurers to set off to go and see the world. And one of the famous quotes in that book was this. When a man is riding through this Gobi Desert by night, and for some reason he gets separated from his companions, he hears spirit voices talking to him. Often these voices lure him away from the path, and he never finds it again. Now, from this quote, there is a wonderful little children's game that we can play at the Wyatt's on Wednesday. And, and it goes, it's a game that we do in the pool. And you know how this game goes. The one who is on the quest for fellow swimmers, they have their eyes closed, and they call out, Marco! And all the while, they're trying to escape Marco, locating them by their, their voice. Now, 
Like this game, when our eyes and our hearts are closed, especially in the faith community, action involvement, obedience, compassion, and generosity cannot be found by the ones that are around us. All of those that are out there who are crying, Marco! Hello. <laughs> when this happens, we stumble through life unable to find the souls that have been pushed down. We are unable to nurture the souls of others so they might know a whole and a complete life. Like David, we live in a world where there is a great deal of uncertainty. Maybe personally we don't have huge outer enemies like Saul. Maybe ours is the Saul that is within ourselves. Within ourselves that drives our fear. That compels us to want to keep things just as they are. <laughs> a war inside that leads to sadness and apathy. Prevents our hearing God's response to our calling out like that child's game. Marco, Marco, Marco. And our, our fear and our grief allow us to hear only silence. And we become lost and isolated and all alone. I've always liked Dennis the Menace. I've always liked that. I, I liked it both as a cartoon strip and as a TV show long ago. In a particular cartoon, there, there was a, a thing that came up that I, I repeated many times throughout my almost three decades of ministry, but I, I always, always felt it was very powerful. See, Margaret tells Dennis that with a few improvements, that he could be at the top of her list as husband material. Well, Dennis says that's too bad because he's just happy with himself as he is. And Margaret ends up asking Dennis, well, what changes would she have to make for him to spend his life with her? And he says, well, you'd only have to have just one change. That's all that's needed. Well, that just thrills Margaret, just one change, and she wants to know what one change does she need to make? And Dennis says, you just have to change into a pony. <laughs> just have to change into a pony. Our nation was founded in the quest for securing a new life. There at Ellis Island, the Statue of Liberty, give me your tired and your poor, the huddled masses yearning to be free. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ said to the church in Galatia, there is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are heirs according to the promise. God loves each person he created. <laughs> no, sometimes we don't understand God's unique and differing creation. But I am sure God does not want us to have to be changed into a pony or anything else. God continues to call us out to witness in our world, to witness to our faith, to dare like David to speak the right words, to speak the loving words, the freeing words. For in doing this, we shall acquire abundant life, a whole life, and not just for ourselves, but for all who God created and in whom God breathed his very breath. The world is crying out, Marco! Oh. Yeah, and those are the ones, the huddled masses, yearning to be free in Christ that we must find ways to embrace. <laughs> Amen. Stand with me if you would. Enjoy. <laughs>